Okay. So the question is, a 53-year-old man with history of fever, not seen by his colleagues for days, brought in, uh, brought in, uh, in auto at Constantinople with two focal seizures. Random blood sugar got to another point was at 8.8 millimoles per liter. High fever of 38.5 degrees centigrade. The analysis showed pressed ketones, positive nitrites, leukocytosis of 20,000, lactate 12.5 millimoles per liter, potassium of 3 millimoles per liter. The pH was 7.34, bicarbonate 17, and then PCO2 30 and PO2 75 millimeter of mercury. <clears throat> The question says, um, list the differential diagnosis. B, what further investigation will you do? C, outline the, the, the treatment. Now, the differential diagnosis here, looking at that question, we see that this patient had um, obvious uh, hyperglycemia, as evidenced by the results that was got in the test. And then uh, we'll also look at the question again, patient came in an unconscious state, and the level of hyper, the level of um, metabolic acidosis uh, by carbonate was 17. So obviously, patient has metabolic acidosis. And then we believe that the DKA is one of the causes of increased uh, anion gap metabolic acidosis. So um, at the same time, uh, this uh, if you look at the pH, it's less than normal, which is 7.3 to 7.45. So obviously, patient has a metabolic acidosis. And from the, um, those patients have focal seizures, we know very well that in the setting of hyperglycemia, a patient may also have come up with seizures, although it can also happen in a hyperglycemic hyposmolar state. So uh, the other differential I have there is hyperglycemic hyposmolar state, which is also characterized by hyperglycemia. And um, of course, patients will also have a decrease in serum. Or, or so plus or minus the effect of um, they also have uh, some degree of water consciousness, depending on the level of hyperglycemia. But one thing that is very clear in this hyperglycemic hyper is that this patient may not have, will not have a, you know, metabolic acidosis as exemplified in our patient. So another one is alcoholic ketoacidosis, another differential. Uh, we know very well this is one of the causes of ketosis, uh, increased, um, increased uh, metabolic uh, acidosis with um, increased anion gap. But typically, patients that have this, this problem may have a history of alcoholic intake and starvation. And then at the end of the day, uh, VH will also be you know, on the low side. But in the setting of this one, the one may not see, um, there may not be accompanying hyperglycemia and you as it were. So next is uh, lactic acidosis. Uh, it's, it's, uh, also known, it's one of the causes of increased anion gap metabolic acidosis. But typically characterized, or we've seen in patients where there is um, associated increased activity of the, maybe the muscle, muscle level and all that, and then the decreased oxygen supply and all that, the degree of, um, you know, the degree of hypoxia, to, you know, and then eventually patient may have this. And then in certain of lactic acidosis, patient may not have evidence of hyperglycemia. So um, acute pancreatitis and appendicitis are differential because they can cause, these are causes of uh, abdominal, abdominal pain, and then, of course, we know that in DKA, it's, it's known that patient may come with uh, severe abdominal pain that may simulate acute abdominal and all that. So that's, why, but, uh, that's how acute pancreatitis and the uh, appendicitis may end up in the facial of this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the other investigations we do, the second part of the question says, what other reasons can you do in this setting? This setting? One may have to do culture of urine and blood, be able to um, find out because in this patient will have an increase the white blood cell count, you know, and that doesn't that does mean that there is no increase in white blood cell count in ketoacidosis. Because it's known that patient may have maybe have a may not be have infection, but still have increased leukocytosis. But it's known very well that um, some literature will say when it is more than 25,000, one which you suspect infection. So it will help us to really find out what's the trigger of this uh, DKA, what was the background. And then the cardiogram also help us to find out the, if there are toilet abnormalities, you know, that may be affecting the heart, the, the hypokalemia and all that. And uh, the, of course, the, sometimes we have other electrolyte disturbances. So it's important that the ECG is done to monitor this patient closely. 
So the enzymes is important because patients that have myocardial infarction may have, may actually, or oh, sorry, myocardial infarction may be a precipitant to DKA. So it's important that um, you know, especially when there is associated chest pain and all that, the cardiac enzyme are excited. So make sure that uh, there is no there is no myocardial infarction in the background. Chest X is important because a chest infection is known to be a good trigger for uh, DKA, you know, a precipitant. So it's important that. If I say that up to 30 to 40 percent of cases, you the chest infection may be a precipitant to the um the DKA. So it's important that chest X-ray is done in all patients. See the electrolyte essay is important. That it's important to do so because uh, in the cost of management, a lot of changes in electrolytes. It will help to make sure that patients manage actively. Oh, very well. Thank you. Next, next slide. Okay. So in the treatment, <clears throat> the diagnosis confirmed. But these are these all I've talked about. And then patients should be admitted in the world. Intensive care unit setting may be necessary for people monitoring. Excuse me. For people monitoring. And also, as patient has the first consciousness, it's good that patient goes to ICU. We are a lot good um, attention to give to this patient. At this point, it's good to determine the GCS to be able to. Monitor the patient closely because um, in as much as patient has this, it's important to always monitor the patient closely to know where patient is actually, you know, getting better and all that. And the and also gastric tissue is important to pass to reduce chances of aspiration. The ureter catheter to pass to monitor input output strictly. Where possible, central venous access is recommended. The other other samples should be collected. Um, samples should be collected for other electrolytes where the kidneys can be done, magnesium and all that, phosphate and chloride. There is important to monitor the acid base status to be able to know the changes, the pH, bicarbonates, and all that. And those hypothetic acid will be monitored as the treatment progresses. Okay, um, it's important that renal function is determined initially and subsequently it is monitored serially. So, um, the, 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 the hard point that is to always monitor your renal foods, it's important to know that before you even start replacing your potassium. And of course, the creatinine is also important because. In the, person, in the setting of decreased um, um, blood volume and all that, you know, patient may end up having AKI, and it's important that this is monitored. Fluid that should be replaced, uh, usually the food of choice is only 0 0.9 saline or lactate ring gas lactate in the first one to three hours. In fact, it said that patient that comes into DKA will have lost up to five to seven liters of fluid. So initial fluid management is so important and it should, it should be rapid, but not too vigorous. And we monitor uh, closely. So 10 to 30 mils per kg per hour is actually advocated. Subsequently, 0.45% saline as 250 to 500 mils per hour it should be treated. And then this should monitor, this should continue until when the sugar level is now 250 mg per DL, you now change to 5% juice, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.45 uh, saline combination. Next slide. So you at this point you should, by the time the patient has given the patient has received some good quantity of uh, well rehydrated uh, to a degree, the short acting insulin should be started. IV access is preferred because if you give sub kit in the setting of severe dehydration, it is known that uh, distribution and all that the, the, the um, access to the system may be may be impaired because of severe dehydration. So it's, ad it's advised that IV short acting solution should be started at those of 0 0.1 units per kg. And then um, that you should receive start, then subsequently per hour. But then it's also advised to give to use the continuous IV infusion because when you do that, it's able to have a good, you know, a good control of the flow of insulin. So the patient, uh, the rate of decrease of insulin will not be so uh, rapid, you know, to, you know, to um, avoid complications like cerebral edema and all that. And of course, um, fluid overload, um, and other things that are associated with that. Then increase two to three folds if no response by two to four hours. Next slide. The BB should monitor the blood sugar should be shaped every one to two hours. The major electrolytes you mentioned, I talked about the, the bicarbonates, the potassium phosphate, and then anion gap should be determined and should be checked every four hours in the first 24 hours. The monitor blood pressure, pulse, respiration, mental status, food input, output. Should be done every one to two hours. Then, the replacement of potassium is important here. 
is that Mr. 40 to 80 minute, minute equivalent hour when plasma potential is less than 3.5 minute equivalent. If initial serum potential is greater than 5.2 minimums, do not supplement potential until potential is corrected. Next slide. You continue the above until the patient is stable. And when the glucose is uh, in the range of 150 to 200 milligram per deal, and as this is resolved, then you, you, insulin should be now be, be, be decreased to 2.0.2 to 0.1 unit per kg per hour. So it's advised that you uh, administer long acting insulin as soon as patient is eating. Uh, allow for a two to four hour overlap in insulin infusion and subcutaneous long acting insulin injection. The natric overstand may be necessary in the event of repeat procedure and in the case in the index patient. So in that case, if patient, um, you know, in, in the wife patient, the patient, it should be advised to give benzodiazepines. It may be it may be useful. And especially when the patient um, start um, when has another episode. The use of spectrum, what spectrum antibodies is important, and this is our case, this patient. So um, the white spectrum antibodies should be used, and then this can be actually be changed when the result of culture, culture tests are out, you know, to guide the antibiotic therapy. Antibiotics may be necessary. Parenteral, parenteral paracetamol may be given, or uh, instead, as the case may be. Anticoagulation may be necessary if hyperglycemia, and uh, you know, if there is severe hyperglycemia for other risk factors present, patient may be anticoagulated. So I think that's um, the end of the, the, that question. So let's have a little overview of the DKA. We are going to take this outline. Definition presentation, okay. So definition, a state of, the DKA is a state of uncontrolled catabolism as still with insulin deficiency. This is the most common endocrine deficiency, emergency, you know, in um, respect to diabetes. Commonly seen with type one diabetes, but maybe seen type two, Diabetes, especially in long standing, long standing diabetics. Mortality is about 2 to 5% in the developed world, but more in the developing country. It accounts for 14.7% of um, diabetes admission in a study that carries out some, um, in Kano. Um, it is more in newly di diagnosed diabetics, 20 to 30%, especially type 1, except earlier. Failure to take insulin, 14 insulin delivery system, or other, other things that can actually instigate it. Um, infections, UTI, and all that can actually be presenting, presenting factors. In some cases, it may not be identified. And um, other things they're also known to, to actually is to get alcohol, macular infection, uh, trauma, psychological stress, pulmonary embolism, and all that. Those are things that actually precipitate that. So in terms of presentation, patients may actually have nausea and vomiting, the increased taste, polyuria, uh, the, 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 the symptoms of uh, diabetes. On the on the on the on the increase on the high side, abdominal pain will present as like talked earlier, and on shortness of breath will be there. The clinical findings actually on examination will, be, will include tachycardia, hypertension, diarrhea, mucous membrane, reduced skin tago. <coughs> Cosmo respiration, respiratory distress will be the abdominal tenderness. Uh, of course, cerebral edema, I uh, mentioned before, which may also have hypertemia or hypertemia. Uh, these are things that possibilities one can find. Then um, examination may actually give um, raised urea with use pectoral creatinine, and that's the dosis I talked about. In the, in the case of a patient was 17 minimum. This patient, when usually when the um, uh, this is actually a severe acidosis, when it's less than 15 minimum per liter, the raised creatinine may present kidney urea talked about leukocytosis. This uh, this uh, days, okay. Raised anion gap. It's always a constant finding um, in DKA and other elevated evidence of infection that CDRT proteins, ES, um, ESR, and all that may be present. Now, in, um, in part of physiology, uh, actually, uh, insulin deficiency, absolute insulin deficiency is central to the, um, in the pathogenesis of DKA. Uh, basically, when there is decreased insulin deficiency and absolute insulin lack in the body of the patient, there is um, consequent decreased insulin uh, uptake, sorry, glucose uptake at the level of the cells. And as, as a result, there is a vision of not necessarily five fatty acids from the adipose tissues and muscles. And this leads to ketogenesis and ketone body formation at the level of the, because of the production of uh, ketones by the, by the, by the liver. Then there is osmotic diuresis, 
as a result of those the severe hypo hyperglycemia, and that leads to dehydration, and of course, to reduce intravascular volume. This will actually instigate the increase in the, the integral counter regulating hormones, like the glucagon, the catecholamines, good hormones. So these are actually anti-insulin. And then um, there is actually increase in glucose output vis-a-vis -vis the action of these counter regulating hormones at the level of the kidney, at the level of the liver, through uh, glucogenesis and glucogenolysis. And then this actually worsening the, the process, hyperglycemia. So because of the, 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 the depression of the mobilization of free fatty acids from the adipose tissues, um, and of course, you know, converted by the, by the liver to ketone bodies, that's ketonemia, ketonuria, and all that, of course, as metabolic acidosis. So, and then a little like disturbances that, is, uh, that are follows it because of metabolic acidosis will ensue. Okay, next slide. Like I thought earlier, the hyperketonemia here, after this is in deficiency, the increase in non esterified fatty acids and then increased ketone body formation. Talked about that. The acidosis that was prevent, and then metabolic acidosis, with the vomiting that come with it, alter consciousness, and of course, the patient will have uh, cosmo breathing. So it is uh, known that hyperglycemia, when it's more than 250 milligrams per deal, uh, is actually, uh, you know, the signal has been severe. And then um, most patients that have this will have metabolic acidosis with pH less than 3.5. 7.35. A patient was that time. This patient was 7.34, and then the ketonuria, the ketonemia, and it was mentioned that the patient had trace of uh, ketones. Uh, the most of the time, it's just more than trace. And a young gap, of course, is, is um, it will be more than 15 uh, millimoles per liter. It's increased iron gap because normally it's 10 to 14. The principal management. Uh, you restore perfusion and hydration, stop ketogenesis by insulin replacement, uh, correct electrolyte imbalance, avoid complications and treat underlying cause on the precipitant. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Puri, for, for your presentation. Uh, yes, so let's go to the question slide. Okay, so it's time for comments, contribution. I know there are tons of uh, um, contribution in the chat box. So I'll go ahead and read the chat box. Okay, um, Dr. Success, thank you for your presentation. So Dr. Kuri, I hope you are hearing me. I'm hearing you clearly, sir. Okay, all right. So uh, thank you for your presentation. Please, is there a reason why neurological conditions such as stroke, cerebral abscess, or meningoencephalitis were not part of your differentials? Okay, so Dr. Success is acting, uh, sorry, is asking that question. I think from this slide, there was history of seizures. So probably that's why she's asking that. Um, Dr. Shamsuddin said, uh, urosepsis too not mentioned, despite evidence of that from the data given. Okay, Dr. Success also had a follow-up question. She said, uh, what's the meaning of confirmed diagnosis? I think the diagnosis should be HHS with complications. Um, Dr. Abimbala said, do you think of sepsis because of the fever and raised WBC, but did not add it to your differentials despite adding blood culture to your list of additional investigation? And Dr. Shamsu, they say, what drop rate of the random blood sugar will you expect? Um, Dr. Bimbola also said that appendicitis and acute pancreatitis that you added, there's no abdominal pain documented in the history. Also, no abdominal pelvic ultrasound or that to confirm if this can be a differential. Um, Dr. Lale can say, good morning. Thanks for the presentation. I would appreciate if you can clarify and explain further on your statement of suspecting infection only when white cell count is greater than 25,000 in patients with DKA. Um, I, Dr. IOJG said, um, said serum procalcitonin due to sepsis. Okay, it's giving you further investigation. Then brain CT can scan to rule out stroke and brain abscess as a differential. So that's IOJG's contribution. Tanimon said, is this more of DKA or HHS? Uh, Dr. Justice said, thanks a lot for your presentation. When will, re when will you repeat the assay for ketones and how frequently? 
in view of the seizures, will your choice of broad spectrum antibiotics be reviewed? Uh, what about thromboprophylaxis in this patient? You kept using the terms like and all that when you needed to list a few things. So I think it's better to list what you can and not end the sentences with terms like that. Okay, Dr. Momo just said, uh, is this a pure metabolic acidosis? There's a type one respiratory failure. Dr. Ifoma said you missed the nitrites. Dr. Christian said patient has HHS. Uh, Dr. Asekame said, I don't think we have enough evidence to say HHS here. Still likely DK or at best a DK HHS overlap. So Dr. Okori, did you did you get all this information or all this? Uh... The questions are so many. I don't know how to start. So so I'll 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 just guide you. Just start and whatever there is left for you to I'll, I'll remind. You. Okay. Um. Let me remember the one talked about uh, the trying to ten possibility of cerebral. I think I talked about uh, yes, cerebral yes, from sure. Yeah. Uh, yes. I wouldn't want to think about that. You know, so although the patient has seizures, but um, because of the Obvious um, uh, hyperglycemia, although patient may be uh, you know, diabetic, uh, not diabetic, I've been issue. Uh, but because of what I have before me, uh, with respect to level of uh, the, the pH, the bicarbonates, and then, of course, if although we don't have our uh, chloride yet, we're able to calculate that ion gap. So that will have given more, that will have played more evidence to DKA. So, um, that's actually what I, I the issue of uh, WBC, uh, actually, is general here or there, but uh, based on the fact that this patient has not been seen for some days, it obviously shows that patient has been endured something with the view of hyperglycemia, maybe in the of the view of uh, weakness, and eventually, you know, instead of having a, you know, you know instead of having a lot more serious problems, so it includes the seizure. So, Actually, uh, in as much as focus is there, the focus is there. So, the brain affects differential, so to say, of that um, uh, focus, focal, focal lesions in the brain, the differential. But based on what we have, what we have, and traces, ketones, and all that, I think uh, that's why I was thinking more of DKA. Then the other question is, uh, yeah, 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 yes, but that's why it's called differential. Okay, it doesn't mean that it has to be the final diagnosis, somebody has seizures, had alter sensorium, then definitely there can be something going, there, there could be something going on in the brain. Okay, there yeah. could be some structural issues going on in the brain. So asking for differential doesn't uh, mean that that is the diagnosis. So for somebody to have seizures, um, alter sensorium, we want to check the brain. We want to do a brain CT scan to see, okay, is there any problem, you know, primarily affecting the brain? Okay, you have stroke and give you other sensorium, can give you seizures, meningo encephalitis, cerebral abscess, space occupying lesions can give you this kind of uh, picture. So uh, putting them as a differential will, will make sense. Okay, even if you know you have your confirmed diagnosis, but uh, or you have you know the most likely you know diagnosis, so it doesn't stop you from bringing you know primary. Uh, brain uh, lesions or disease condition as your differentials. Okay, even though uh, success uh, wants to say something um, as regards to that. So just hold on a bit. Okay, success. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much, uh, the presenter. Thank you, Dr. Hata. Um, So I know that we are taught as clinicians to make a clinical diagnosis. So if uh, we were in a center where we did not do random blood glucose. I'm not sure we're we'll talking about the diabetic people. Now, apart from that, in the study we did in Accent, more than 10% of patients with stroke, like the first ever stroke, without a prior diagnosis of diabetes, they had unrecordably high glucose level at presentation. And we know that hyperglycemia is a poor predictor of stroke outcome. So when you see, even if you, so whether the patient has features of naturalizes, this patient has other sensory has seizures, you know, and now it's having a record of high random problems. I think a, a stroke should actually be considered. Even if at the end of the day, it comes out to be HHS. If we actually do a CT scan, we may even see 
um, the microvascular impacts in the brain. Okay, so um, I think that neurological complications should be your differentials more than even the acute pancreatitis that we've seen and even the appendicitis that was seen. And that's what I just wanted to contribute. Thank you. I know others have made so many comments. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Okori, can you continue? Uh, yes, uh, the other one talked about uh, anticoagulation. No. I mentioned that. Uh, Okori, uh, you can also. I mentioned it all. I said for those, for the questions you cannot remember, you can also look at the chat yourself and then. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. So for the. The, the anticoagulation somebody talked about, asked about, uh, I mentioned that the anticoagulation will be, be, will be considered, especially if patient has other risk factors, you know, especially if patient has hyperglycemia and other risk factors. Actually, if the empire is patient should be anticoagulated. Uh, then the other one is, um, uh, let's see. Okay, well, um, okay, let me just help you out. Okay, Shamsu didn't see. So you totally ignored the UTI from your data that okay. you were given. I yes, tried yes. to, you see. I know, I actually, I, the, you're not right, actually, the indicator of infection, we know that. So that was what I talked about, urine culture, and then, um, and then okay, I mentioned urine culture, we turned to level the blood culture. So I didn't, it's didn't, not as if I forgot about it entirely. So that should be done. And then I said, why spreading antibiotics should be started? So why are we waiting for the result of the of the urine culture or blood culture, which will guide further antibiotics? Uh, and I mentioned that. Okay. So, so now uh, the next is is it HHS or DK? Uh, well, like well, what I say from I think I I'm more I'm more I'm, I tend to tilt more towards DK than uh, HHS on in the on the respect to the. Yeah, no, we know very well that test ketones can be in the HHS, you know that. Uh, but because of the um, patient thing to have, you know, although we don't have chloride, like I said earlier, they would have applied the anion gas. But if we are if you are with this, what, what, what the parameters already are before us, we get almost 200 in the, you know, in the anion gap. So that's the also that to, you know, support DKA, you know. And then, um, uh, the other thing again is uh, this patient that has WBC that was in the highest uh, it is not known to occur like that in the HSA because even in the setting of, you know, a DKA where there is no infection, the patient may have elevated leukocytosis. You have a So it is in the thing, it is in the infection. So uh, these are these two and two together. I think the uh, patient have more of DKA than HSA. But it's a very close relationship to the DKA. Um uh, okay. Okay, Dr. Success, you want to say something? Okay. Or is do your okay? I've not... I, I don't know. I'm not an endocrinologist, but I think the endocrinologist should actually speak. I think the patient's feature is more in the children. I know I know we have answered this question before. And when okay. the endocrinologist, I know I remember one of their contributions when they said that for a patient that has diabetes to have this kind of you know, before this patient had this kind of um, high random blood glucose, patient would have died. So I, you know, so the HHS, you know, um we don't have to be high blood glucose is in keeping with HHS. Apart from that, um for us to really um, seek ahead for DKA, you know, the ketones should be more than two. Yeah, so two crosses. Then this patient has um, hypokalemia, of course, which is also expected, even if you can be seen in both. This patient has um, fever, so it means that there may be a sepsis, you know, precipitating these HHS. Okay. Now, even though I like the last question I asked, HHS and DKA um, overlap. They may um, patients with HHS may have just small, small, you know, maybe a little of um, um, acidosis, a little of um, ketonemia, but this is more in keeping with HHS. Hello. Yeah, we Hello. Good morning. Oh, okay. Good yes. morning, doctor. Doctor, yes. Okay. okay, can I speak? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, um, I think of like uh, the patient actually has um the, um HHS, um because for a patient to have diabetic ketoacidosis, 
Um, you should have the combined. Okay, so you should have the you have the combined at least presence of three biochemical abnormalities. Usually, yes, there's there's ketone, presence of ketone in the urine of this patient, but it's not just ketone, it's a significant ketoneuria. And that's at least two pluses or ketonemia greater than at least, I think this are three millimole per liter there, but greater than to three millimeter was the word is significant ketonuria, not just three. So that's who said this. So that uh, trace is not enough. Now, when you look at the other thing is hyperglycemia. In DK, we tend to use um, the, the hyperglycemia may not be so marked, greater than 11 millimole per liter is okay, or a non diabetic. So it may not be so marked, but when you start having marked in HHS, you're talking about greater than like 30 millimole per liter. And you can see that this patient is more in keeping with that. Now, another thing is a bicarbonate. Okay, so the bicarbonate usually for DK, the cutoff is at less than 15 millimole per liter. Right, and at this patient, yeah, from the question here is less than 17. It's, it's, uh, it's 17, so it has to be less than 15. And it can go on and on, even the, the, the pH, you know, it's less than 7.3 for DK. That's the really cutoff we use. But this patient is less than, uh, is less than 7.34. So I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that they, may, of course, this man has been this, there may have been some maybe um, perspective or form of compensation, but. Obviously, what this patient has from the hyperglycemia, the ketonemia, PS, everything is pointing towards HHS. Actually, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think yes, we had we had uh, when we when we answered this question earlier, there was this controversy. Yeah, I think well, one of the issues was calculating the osmolarity because. You have to calculate as your molarity for you to also portray the fact that okay, the person is having HHS or not. Uh, urea was not uh, given, I remember. And then um, not given the acidosis, the lactic acidosis. Uh, I, I, I think Dr. Mamza said uh, your sepsis can give you those kind of uh, acidosis. And then, of course, you have your blood to your pH. So, I know it was um, between HHS, is it DK, HHS, um, um, overlap. overlap uh, well, uh, maybe. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, teacher. Sir. I just wanted to point out that most of the when we look at the metabolic acid, we don't tend to look at uh, if whether it's a pure metabolic acid or whether there's any component. Affected. If you calculate using the Winter's formula for D, you find out that this is not a pure metabolic acidosis. There's likely a respiratory acidosis alongside this. Please. So it's in, in, it, not just your pure one. So I, I think it's something of note. We shouldn't just see bicarbonate low and the uh, pH in the acidosis size and just put it. Start looking at whether there's any compensation or any uh, additional uh, um, uh, abnormality as Thank you. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Oh, sorry, sorry. Just want to clarify something from the last speaker. I, I think this PCO two is actually tending towards mental respiratory alkalosis rather than acidosis. I hope I, I don't know if I'm wrong. And that you, would actually, if you calculate it, if you calculate the um, expected uh, PCO two, just use the Winters formula. I think you get like thirty three point uh, 
something and plus or minus two, even when you minus it, you understand. You find out that this is below less. that. This is this is below that, which should be respiratory alkalosis now, not acidosis. Am I getting it wrong? Thank you. Alkalosis. Yes. And that suggests that the person is trying to compensate by hy hyperventilation. Now, I'm not going to let me argue with the endocrinologist, but if a person is actually hyperventilating in the setting of a, a hyperglycemic emergency, that sounds more like what you have in DK, Kusma breathing. Of course, I'm not an endocrinologist and they know better, but this looks more like respiratory alkalosis or tending towards that. That's what I was pointing out. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't quite get you very well. Sorry about that. If the major PCO2 is greater than the uh, uh, predicted uh, PCO2, you'll be thinking of an additional respiratory acid. But if the major yeah. PCO2, yes, is less than the predicted, that's when you'll be thinking of the uh, respiratory acidosis. Uh, yes, uh, exactly. Thank you. Okay, uh, can we round up? I know there are tons of questions, tons of um, um, clarifications that um, we want to we want to give. So, um, okay. So, um, let me go back to the chat box and just take a few comments so that uh, we can move on. I know. We will not end with this uh, because everybody has uh, his uh, own. Uh... Okay, so um, okay, so Doctor Asekeme is saying we have enough evidence for DK, not not enough for HHS, but um, um, then um. Because the seizures are focal on said lateralizing pathologies such as stroke, okay. Uh, the contralateral cerebral must be considered, okay. We talked about the differential. So, Dr. Chika saying DKA diagnostic criteria bicarbonate is less than 15, pH is less than 7.3, ketonuria at least 2 plus, or ketonemia of greater than 3 millimoles per liter. Uh, random blood glucose is also greater than 30 millimoles. Which is in keeping with HHS. Uh, okay, the random blood sugar is greater than 30 millimoles, which is in keeping with HHS. This patient doesn't meet the above criteria for DKA. The mild acidosis in the question is from lactic acidosis. I think the comprehensive diagnosis should be um, HHS precipitated by sepsis, uh, focus UTI. Um, then um, the seizures are also more in keeping with HHS. Um, then Dr. Momon is a ketosis prone type 2 DM or flat bush diabetes. Um, Dr. Charles said the mild acidosis may be due to lactic acidosis rather than ketoacidosis. I can say metabolic acidosis with partial compensation. Okay. So um, I don't know if there's any contributions from our teachers before we go to Dr. Odanye for his presentation. I know we've, we've spent... Uh, much time on this um, question. Any other contributions from our teachers? Hello, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello? Yes, can we hear me? We can hear you, sir. Okay. So, um, Thank you, Dr. Corey, for the presentation, and thank you, everyone, for the robust contribution. Um, I just want to say clearly here that uh, this is West African exam. Most often times, they are interested in your line of thought. They want to know if you understand what DKA HHS actually is. Sometimes in the exam proper, you may even be guided, okay? So when you are seeing something, they can point out something to you. What of this? Didn't you see this one? And then it will now help you to maybe to reboot, to rethink, to see what they're actually thinking. The picture painted can actually go for so many things. It can go for DKA, it can go for HHS, it can even go for a mixed syndrome, okay? And um, sometimes you might not be absolutely sure of what the, what the clear answer is. 
But most often times in the exam, if you are relaxed and uh, you take the body, you look at the cues from the examiners, they might lead you to what they are thinking about. So um, don't worry about all the arguments, about all the discussions, it's actually part of it. Now we have known so many things. People have talked about compensatory, compensation when someone has metabolic um, acidosis and all that. So it just adds to your knowledge and reaches you. So just have an open mind. That's what they want in West Africa. An open mind and then um, you know many of your stuff and that's just all. So I encourage us to just keep it up. Thank you. All right, um, doc, thank you very much, sir. Dr. Odai, can you, can you commence your presentation? Thank you, um, Okoye. For, thank you, sir. Good morning, good morning to the house, to, good morning to our teachers and colleagues. Um, this morning, I'm taking um, question seven from October 2021. A minute, my screen is not moving, one minute, let me see. Okay, so um, uh, the question is about the 23-year-old with history of smoking, um, depression, and had headache a few weeks earlier, presented with um, sudden onset of headache, neck pain, altered sensorium, blood pressure was 180 over 110, pulse rate was uh, 110 beat per minute, a picture of the CT scan of the brain showing intraventricular hemorrhage um, was uh, um, presented and um, from the guide we have here, they're suggesting that the patient likely has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So they asked a number of questions. Uh, one was to mention five um, risk factors in this patient and how the patient will be managed. <clears throat> Sorry, they mentioned two complications and how you will manage them. So um, I just thought of doing a little summary on um, um, subarachnoid hemorrhage before going to the questions. Okay. Um, the picture is just to actually uh, help us um, differentiate a number of uh, intraventricular um, um, uh, hemorrhages um, that we have. Um, so the subdural hemorrhage, um, the EP, the EP, dura, the subdural hemorrhage, and the subarachnoid, which I will say elaborate on further. So the term subarachnoid hemorrhage refers to extravasation of blood into the subarachnoid space between the P and the arachnoid membrane. And um, so... Uh, it could actually be um, traumatic and then non um, traumatic. And um, however, familiar use of um, subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, refers to uh, non traumatic um, uh, hemorrhage, and uh, which uh, usually uh, is due to um, rupture of the cerebral aneurysm or arteriovenous uh, malformation. Okay. So for the non traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, 80% um, of them is said to be due to barrier aneurysm and um, uh, rupture of um, arteriovenous malformation is the second most identifiable cause, which accounts for about 10%. And then the other um, possibilities are also um, listed there. However, it is said that in about 15% of patients that have subarachnoid hemorrhage, a cause may not be able to may not be able to pinpoint a, a cause as it were. So these are a list of uh, less common causes of um um, so I like not an hemorrhage for the sake of time. I want to move a bit faster. Okay. So what are risk factors uh, that make a patient susceptible to having um, subarachnoid hemorrhage? Smoking is a risk factor, as was stated in this patient. Use of alcohol, um, bleeding disorders uh, for women, postmenopausal, uh, and decreased level of estrogen. And uh, for those who have close relatives that have um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, they are about three to five times at risk of a subarachnoid um, hemorrhage. So um, just to highlight this, uh, uh, what risk factors that are not, as it were, not associated with subarachnoid hemorrhage, use of um, oral contraceptives is not a risk factor, hormone replacement therapy is not a risk factor, hypercholesterolemia is not a risk factor, and vigorous phys physical activity is not a risk factor for subarachnoid and hemorrhage. So going to the clinical features, uh, you know, most of these patients tend to actually present with the headache, which is a cicita, and is referred to as a thunder clapping um, headache. And then a number of other differentials that might need to run through our mind, like a patient having pituitary apoplexy, having a cervical uh, artery uh, dissection, subdural hemorrhage, hemorrhage, and uh, cerebral artery uh, dissection, and other differential of the uh, occipital um, thunder clap and headache. So due to raising trapezoidal pressure, they could also have um, vomiting, and then some of them could present with seizures. The patient could have a dizziness, diplopia, um, visual loss, and then ultimately they may um, uh, have a coma. So the horror, as it were, assigned to note before a patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage, 
Uh, the number of them are said to have a sensory or motor disturbance. Um, seizure could be um, um, a warning sign, and tosis, bruit, and uh, dysphagia. So for physical examination, um, a number of times, some patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage may have normal physical examination. However, um, most of them will have elevated blood pressure, and they could also be febrile. And then the uh, um, this uh, the increase in temperature will likely due to chemical meningitis from the subarachnoid and blood products. And uh, using the um, looking into the eyes, they could also have papillary edema. And 25% uh, of patients tend to have a focal neurologic abnormality, and the number of them will have a, a third nerve, um, a th a cranial nerve three and a six um, um, palsy. And then uh, the uh, ONS and the NS uh, grading can also be used to assess uh, in this patient as uh, grade one to um, four. One has no mortality. And then for grade two, they tend to have a stiff neck and cranial nerve palsy, which accounts for about 11% of mortality. And then also um, uh, grade three, they tend to be drowsy, which is funny about 37%, account for 37% of mortality. Four, they are drowsy with hemiplegia, so it has 71% of the mortality. And lastly, is a prolonged and coma, okay? So investigations to be done in patients with subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, cranial CT, uh, which could detect uh, blood in 90% of patients in 24 hours. Well, um, help can also be done um, if um, the CT is negative and there are no contraindications to uh, lumbar puncture more than 12 hours after the onset of headache. A full blood count is important, careful to rule out any background uh, uh, infection in, in this patient and also even look at the platelet. The clotting profile is also important for patients who have a clotting abnormality which could make them susceptible. Um, it's good to have a baseline EUCL done such that um, while managing the patient, if there are issues along the line, we can actually um, make comparison with our baseline EUCL. And then uh, to also rule out a, a cardiac component, because some people might just come in unconscious, we're not too sure of what the patient has. So to rule out um, cardiac um, um, involvement and uh, do your ECG. And then the CT and and MRI might also be helpful if the patient needs a surgical uh, intervention. So this is just uh, the CT showing this apparel dense. The arrow, okay, the, the arrow showing in the subarachnoid space, we can appreciate this apparel dense um, um, quite a, uh, texture or uh, picture here, okay, as opposed to where we have a normal, okay. Here we notice that this is a dark isodense which has a cerebral spinal fluid. But for patient who has a um, Subarachnoid hemorrhage won't be able to appreciate the cerebral spinal fluid. What will be prominent will be the bleed, which will come out as hypertense. Okay. So, what are complications that these patients may have? Um, rebleeding is said to be the common cause of death in this group of patients. And then another uh, complication to keep to mind is also vasospasm, which could explain why some of them have cerebral ischemia. Okay. And some of them could also have hydrocephalus, which is due to blockage of the arachnoid granulations. Um, some of them could have uh, aponatremia, seizures, cardiac dysfunctions can also be um, found in this group of patients. So for treatment, ABC of resuscitation is important um, to start with, and the patient will likely need ICU care. And um, so patient needs uh, to be well hydrated, and the essence of that is to uh, maintain cerebral perfusion for this patient. And um, it's recommended that patients should get an imodipine, um, which helps to reduce vasospasin. And um, beta blocker can also be uh, used to lower the blood pressure if it is not uh, contraindicated, uh, particularly intravenous, if it's not contraindicated. The patient with a uh, raised intracranial pressure can be treated with an uh, hyperventilation to achieve a, a partial pressure of um, uh, CO2 of uh, 30 to 35. And uh, other things that can also be used are uh, osmotic agents like uh, manitol, uh, loop diuretics, and the use of uh, steroid is said to be controversial. So uh, for patients who have seizures, seizure prophylaxis can also be offered uh, to this group of patients. Um, surgical treatment um, also helps um, by uh, making an attempt to clip the um, um, uh, ruptured uh, barrier aneurysm and the endovascular treatment using of coils can also be um, used. Um, some patients may have a nation which should be treated with intubation and hyperventilation. And uh, for those who have a loss, uh, it's, it's said to be managed by using a drain, ventricular or lumbar drain for this group of patients. So back to the question, um, we were, were told to actually mention five and risk factors. Uh, for this patient, I was able to only pick two because we were told the patient was smoking and um, use of alcohol. I think other things to just ask is that if patient, if there was this true of a subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage, 
in the in the family it could also make the patient and a bit susceptible to having subarachnoid hemorrhage. The other things that came across were patients have breathing disorders, um, postmenopausal post -menopause, uh, women. So on how to manage this patient, I think I just highlighted, but for the sake of the exam, I actually prefer to start by talking about um, taking a quick um, history, after taking a quick history to um, also um, um, investigate, investigate the patient. Okay, so the principal investigation will be to a confirmed diagnosis, which is it will help us to do, and to also rule out uh, different uh, uh, differentials, other things that uh, present uh, like a subarachnoid and hemorrhage, and then to also evaluate the patient for complications and to help us to prognosticate the patient with respect to the investigations. However, with respect to um, treatment of the patient, um, the principle of treatment will be to actually uh, take care of symptoms that the patient has, okay? And the patient could uh, come in with a uh, respiratory distress, the patient could come in with seizures, all of those should be taken uh, care, care of as the patient then comes in. And then to also uh, relate the patient to um, uh, ensure cerebral perfusion for the patient. So the second principle of management will be to look for the uh, etiology and to uh, manage um, the etiology. If it's uh, the um, uh, is an aneurysm, I want to uh, rupture aneurysm. I actually want to maybe clip or use coils to um, take care of that, lower the blood pressure for the patient, and then also uh, look out for complications that the patient uh, will have and also manage the complication as such as I earlier um, stated. Okay, then uh, the um, third question is to mention two complications and how it will be managed. So um, one, you can have a rebleed in this patient and rebleeding can actually be managed by um, 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 uh, clipping the vessels uh, or use of endo, uh, Vascular coil, and it's also so that patients should have absolute bed rest and um, should not be allowed to uh, move around, um, just uh, maintain strict uh, bed rest. And for those who have constipation, they could also benefit from use of uh, liquid paraffin to ensure that patient does not strain. The straining patient can actually uh, bleed more. So, whatever it is that will make the patient strain, we need to look into that and to um, help out in that regard. And also for vasospasm, so use of uh, nimodipine will help us reduce. Um, uh, vaso, uh, vasospasm in this patient, we can cause cerebral uh, infarction. And for patients who have atrocephal loss, uh, they can be managed by using a drain um, to, so I can manage by use of a of a drain. Um, thank you for listening. Welcome um, uh, our contributions. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dany, for, for your presentation. So uh, we welcome contributions, questions, clarifications. Um, Dr. Rukaya said, uh, isn't, thank you for your presentation, isn't the patient use of cocaine and the severely elevated BP risk factors in the patient? The, the, there was no history of use of cocaine in this patient. However, I think those are, uh, when I was searching, they didn't lay too much emphasis on, I didn't see, um, um, okay, but I think hypertension is also a risk factor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other contributions? Any other comments? Doctor Success, can go ahead. Um. Good morning, um, colleagues. Um, thank you for the lucid presentation. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the question isn't the patient's use of cocaine, and yeah, so cocaine is a risk factor for for um hemorrhagic stroke. Um, I want to start from the um SAH. Um, I would just really want to say that um, it's comprises about ten percent of um. Patients with um, hemorrhagic stroke. Um, in pattern differentials, we consider, and most of the time, especially in this patient that is 20 years old, you know, and having features of uh, um, you know, SAH. Um, I think meningitis is an important differential we should consider in this patient. And of course, the next question will be: how do we differentiate? Because when patients, you know, in this age group, 23, come with features of ACH, we are confused. Are we dealing with a meningitis? Are we dealing with an SAH? So one of the clues that will help us is that 
um, for patients that have meningitis, most of the time, um, you know, they present with fever earlier. Okay, so why patients with SAH we present with fever, you know, in the course of the disease after the um, episodes have occurred. Also, meningitis and um, hypertensive emergency. Now, other complications that I just want to comment about, which uh, um, is also important, um, I don't know if you mentioned it, is um, vessel spasm. Now, patients with vessel spasm um, tend to pose a threat to us because most of the time they are the reasons why most patients, you know, with SAH, you know, um, you know, die. And they're more one of the reasons why we record high mortality. So apart from the rebleeding and of course the other features of um, is the um, ICP. SAH is time you won't just want to decide what you want to do. Are we going is this patient having um an indication for clipping? You know, especially as well, that will depend on what you do in your environment. Whether you want to, you know, whether you want to clip or you want to do other um, interventions for the patient. So ABC of visualization is important. Most of the time, um, you know, the presenter said that um, that uh, in most of the patients we may have normal findings. Um, I don't think that may be true because in most of the patients they don't. No, I didn't say most. I said some don't patients. Have, they don't have my uh, abnormal. They don't... Okay, some. I wrote some. it down. Maybe okay. you didn't. Let me go there. So, uh, so I wrote it down. So some, okay, so just a very few of them. So for prognosis, um, most the prognosis for SH is very high. Okay, so most of the time, about 10 to 20% um, of them may even die before reaching the hospital. So when we see patients with SH, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a neurological emergency and everything just has to be done. So I like um, your management. You have said we even have to give these patients lactulose so that we want to prevent anything That will raise the you know in um, you know the intracranial pressure. Apart from the hunt and head skill that you talked about, you know we also have other skills we use in grading SAH. Okay, like the Fisher scale and then the World Federation of Neurological Society scale. Now, why this is important is, you know, so I was saying that you will also grade your patient. So this patient that came and um, what which scale are we giving her in the hunt and health? Is this scale one, two, or okay, three or four? So you know, in bit of answer this question, these are the you know ways we want to answer it. So that when you say this patient has for example, hunt and head scale and um, three, we know that this patient may just have a mild focal neurology deficit and maybe just a mild confusion compared to five that the patient is deeply comatose, of course, and also moribund. So these are my small um, contributions. If there are other inter questions too, um, we can. Thank you, man. Yeah, thank you. Vital contribution. Wonderful contribution. Okay, so um, Dr. Olaleka, so will you manage oh, in sorry. five? Um, so, so, get so, that. Now, will you manage in ICU? I mentioned it. I think I let me go there. I mentioned it. Uh, let me go there. That I ICU. That okay. So, thank you for present. Please, on your CT images, can you show us the area of intraventricular hemorrhage as specified in the question? Uh, Dr. Mosokwe yeah. said, well done for your presentation. What determines which one to choose between endovascular? Coiling and clipping. Uh, Dr. Rukaya said, uh, I think follow up to, to the use of cocaine. Say, therefore, toxicology screen may be useful for young people like this patient. Um, Dr. Esther said, please remind us of the CSF findings. Um, then, Dr. Laleko said, what about multidisciplinary approach? The neurosurgeon, the, inter the interventionist rehabilitation, uh, drug, etc. Okay, uh, Dr. Ekele, I say thank you for the beautiful presentation. Is there anything about managing in a quiet place? Okay. Let's know. Um, yeah. Okay, sir, I can just uh, make a uh, react to that. So managing in a quiet place was, was also part of what I read. I said it could also um, uh, um, help um, the um, management of the patient. Then the um, uh, CSF finding is they said to have this uh, xanthochromia, which confirms subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, in uh, those who have uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then I think apart from the uh, uh, lumbar puncture, I think I missed. I'm trying to remember another question that was asked. 
um, the, the, the findings of lumbar puncture managing a quiet environment. I think that was one question I was yeah. like, I'm trying to. Okay. What? Okay. Okay. Did that, sir? You the line was a bit broken when you spoke. Uh, I mean, which one to choose between endovascular coiling and clipping? Okay, I think from what I read, I think the coiling seems to be better than the uh, clipping. The neurologist can help me with that. But for what I read, endovascular um, uh, uh, coiling seems to be better than the clipping. Thank you. Yeah, so, and then uh, somebody was asking the CSF findings. Did you mention that too? Yeah, so they, have, they said it could appear um, looking like yellow after several hours um, due to um, a breakdown of um, uh, hemoglobin, which could have this antichromia appearance which I spoke about earlier. Okay. And then Dr. Tanimu is here. I think his age, male, gender, smoking, depression, and high blood pressure are all risk factors. Dr. Asekeme is asking um, the neurologist in the house. Is there um, a seizure prophylaxis we can need on for SAH? I had the impression that seizures are treated if they occur. So uh, in this clarification, do you give prophylaxis for seizures in SAH patients? Okay, can I answer? Yeah. Yes. Okay, can I answer, please? Thank you. Hello, Dr. Asa, can I answer? He said you can go ahead. Oh, sorry, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Okay, so, um, well, we do not do um, seizure prophylaxis for patients with SAH. Okay, however, um, if this patient has EEG features, okay, so you suspect that this patient... <laughs> has it, hello? We can hear you. So you say, uh, you suspect that this patient, you know, may likely have seizures. You do an EEG and you see, you know, subtle features in EEG uh, that this patient maybe may have seizures. Then we can give um, anti seizure medications. But routinely for patients with SAH, we do not give um, anti seizure medications. I want to stop there. But for neurologists, we know that in the current, you know, in the current guideline, you know, using the you know, this American and Neurologist Association, you know, they, they think that if you, if this patient has a very high, um, you know, charge of having seizures, you may actually, you know, use your clinical discretion to give. But, you know, this is Nigeria. What we have agreed in Nigeria is that for patients that have SAH, if you think they have more, they have a likelihood of having seizures, you do an EEG, and of course, you see features that this patient may be having, may have been having subtle seizures, then you can give anti- and seizure medication. Okay, so we routinely do not give anti seizure medications in SAH. Thank you. Okay, yeah, Dr. Soxer, what analgesic is of uh, uh, is used in SAH? Because somebody asked, Dr. Esther asked on the, in the group chat. And okay, okay, so can, can I log off of the computer? I want to log off with my phone. I need to enter the word now, please. I'll, okay, I'll no. be talking on my phone. Thank you. I need to. Thank you. Yes, the success. Okay, so um, for patients that have um, I don't pain, Dr. Ata. Dr. Yes. Ata. Yes, okay, I spoke like Dr. Augustine. Yes, it's us. It's Dr. Augustine. Yes. Yes. You want? Is it, I'm with you. Is it your life? MD. And they maybe take away from their onset, from their foundation, that you don't go into their own medical college. Dr. Dye. They are doing a biological. Yes, I'm with you, ma'am. So just have it. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yes, yes. You say you're going to the ward? Yes, to the ward. As in, my boss, my contact is uh, waiting for me to do a procedure okay, for you. Okay, please. But okay. But I'll, I'll be with my phone. I want to, I'm in the car, so I want to uh, get out now and connect with my phone. Thank you. There's Sorry, no please. problem. So we just want to thank you officially, really. It was a wonderful yes, presentation. You shouldn't just go out like that. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, we appreciate yes, you. Please keep speaking more. I love your time management. Please keep keep, keep speaking more yes, in class. We need to keep, we yes, need to hear your voice. What's your source specialty, please? Cardiology. Oh, that is nice. Cardiology. Cardiology training. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you can sir. go and meet Tokolotan, please. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Yes. Yes. And the residence is just. But our success, you can continue, please. Just need to appreciate him appropriately. Yeah. yeah th thank you so much, ma'am. Okay, so for for us, we can use them um, opioids in managing their pain. Okay, but um, in a like uh, in our environment where you know opioids are not readily available. Okay, we try as much as possible to see how you know we can also do other supportive management. You know, you know for such as making sure that these patients, you know, um, raised ICP is well controlled. You know, and other supportive management. But most of the time, what we use for their pain control is um, opioids. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Success. Mm, then I don't know. I wanted to just give a mnemonic on the, on the management of SAH. If I don't have the time, I'll put it on the platform. Thank you. Drop it on the platform. Morning, everyone. Sorry, Doctor Asa, please. I just have a question for um, Doctor Success. Just a question for her. I don't know if I can. I can go ahead. Okay. Um, as regards the brain imaging, you know, somebody asked the question: What exactly? Um, where is the bleed on the brain imaging we just removed? So I wanted to know whether that like the crab-like appearance where they bleed into the system. So I don't know. I have that question for Doctor Success. Do you have an idea that the brain imaging that was just removed? Okay, so I wish that um, the brain imaging is actually there. We are talking about it. Okay, so that's one of those images. Yeah, well, so one of them is the crab-like crab, um, crab -like appearance. However, in patients with SH, it's just about um, 30, 20 to 10, uh, 20 to 35 percent of them that will come down with that crab-like appearance, you know, of SH. Okay, so you really need to see that, you know, so apart from that crab-like appearance, you could see that there are, you know, those scripts, scripts, scripts of blood in the systems in the brain. It could be anywhere. It must not just be in the, you know, that um, that system, okay, causing that crap. It may, can be in any other system in the brain. Okay, so sometimes we can even have these experiments in Kelly uh, SAH, which has the best prognosis. We are these patients, you know, they are, they, their prognosis is excellent and, you know, they don't come down with, you know, uh, you know, like, you know, their prognosis is not as worse as other people that have uh, maybe aneurysm, maybe in the MSCA, you know, on any other part of the, you know, system. So that cardiac appearance may just be seen in about 30% of patients. So if you are waiting for that cardiac appearance to say this is SAH, it may, it may not be what they will bring in the exam. So just know that the, the blood, you may just see scripts of blood in the system, okay, in the brain, and that will give you the, the diagnosis. But I wish the imaging was there and I, we are talking about it so that I will explain better. Okay, so so the, the imaging they just removed is is it the crab like appearance or something else? I just wanted to no, know it's not, because I we, think it it's showed not. more than one image. Abi, if I'm not wrong, I'm, I think he showed more than okay, one sorry, image. So, yeah, so I wish, or maybe I can screenshot the crab like appearance sent to the platform. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Doctor Success. Oh, uh, my time is well spent, so I'll hand over to Doctor Christopher. Hello, Dr. Tata. Yes, ma. We can hear you, ma. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I must appreciate the speakers today, both um, Dr. Corey, Dr. Odai. Just a wonderful presentation, both really. The last speaker managed his time better. The first speaker was a little relaxed, like he had all the time. Please, we need to really take time management. Time management is of the essence. This, um, exam is timed. I sometimes I feel it's even faster in the exam than in reality. So if you want to practice instead of practicing the actual time, practice with less time so that you shall get those good for national. They tend to have more STEM questions so that you you will not be caught off guard when you are used to it already. You will be caught off guard. So we spent a lot of time because I really want us to keep to time. Let's always try to end by eight so that he had Dr. Dye is because I'm already waiting for him. And um, we miss important contributions from the participants and our teachers if we close late, because most people, I personally, I'm supposed to be in a meeting by now. So um, so because I, I have to end this class, so I have to be absent. But other persons 
don't have that option. They have to go for their money meeting. So we miss out on important contributions from certain persons if we keep closing late. And time management is part of our training here. So please, let's, let's uh, the participants, the everyone, please, really, let's help Dr. Dr. Atai here. It's not easy. And let's not keep repeating questions, repeating comments, what has been said before. Let's just let it be. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Dr. Atai, good news for you. We finally got to you. An assistant is the one, is a classroom for national. He will be assisting you for now until you guys are gone for your exam. Then he will take over the national class. I don't know okay. if in class. Dr. Yahya Mohammed is a neurologist. Oh, okay. He's, uh, you know him? No, 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 no. I, but he has been contributing to the class. Too. Yes, Dr. Yahya, Yahya Mohammed is a classroom for the national participant. So he will be supporting you why we are supporting you as much as we can. Uh, we'll be assisting you. But both of you are class trip, really. But so both of you will take care of the class if you have. So if you want him to come in, I don't know, both of you can discuss of the meeting on how yeah. you on how